coming up on Digital Music Trends 178 on the 9th of April 2014, the latest on YouTube music, Vivendi sells SFR, we hear from Ty Roberts a grace note on the partnership with Deezer for its rhythm platform and we also hear from Paul Springer from Rhapsody about the company's latest numbers, we chat about the upcoming All That Matters conference and the latest developments in Asia, discuss music sales declines in Australia and hear about the Big Sound conference in Brisbane, and we also mention AIM's startup fund, Prince's new publishing company and Bacardi's Bat video. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is a weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And uh, uh, DMT is available on a variety of channels including iTunes, uh, most podcatchers including Downcast uh, and of course the podcast app on, uh, on iTunes, uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud and many more channels. Uh, to get in touch with the show you can tweet us on at DigiMusicTrends and I uh, hope I appear fully awake this morning to you as it's 8am uh, here in uh, London but I have two fantastic guests uh, from from Australia and Hong Kong, uh, so it's a real pleasure to have uh, Nico Byrne here, General Manager of the uh, of AIR, the Independent Australian Record Label Association, and Executive Producer at Big Sound. So hi Nick and thanks for joining us, how's it going? Uh, very well Andrea, very well. Thanks That's for having me and good to see Jasper there too. Yeah, it's great. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you. And it's also a real pleasure to have uh, Jasper Donut, uh, uh, who is uh, the uh, co-founder of uh, uh, Branded and CEO of Branded and the president at Music Matters. So hi, Jasper, and thanks for joining us. Great to see you. Thank you very much for having us uh, on the show. It's great to have you. And so, uh, of course, we're going to talk about uh, your respective uh, organizations and events. Uh, but uh, I want to uh, kick off the show by talking about YouTube. And uh, as always, it's pretty hard to talk about a service uh, as being hit by delays when uh, a service has not been announced yet. And everything we're basing ourselves on is, is rumors, really. But according to sources, the YouTube music streaming service uh, that was meant to launch in Q4, and this is reported by Billboard, has hit some roadblocks and may not launch until late summer. So. Uh, um, uh, the key problem here, according to Billboard, is a product one, as YouTube is trying to figure out how to give a visual representation to tracks that don't have an official uh, video yet. Uh, and so they are working on a, a bunch of different um, possible solutions, including, uh, uh, for example, uh, having some stock footage that would go alongside the artwork and mix those up uh, to create a compelling uh, a visual uh, uh, representation of the track. Of course, the majority of tracks that are on streaming services would not have an official video associated to them on YouTube, and so that poses a problem for the service. Uh, so um, YouTube also seems to want to come out with a fully baked product, as opposed to what they've, Google has done so far, which is release uh, you know, beta products that are beta essentially endlessly until years and years later they become non-beta products uh, and so uh, they want to try and compete directly with the likes of Spotify and uh, the new Beats music uh, uh, you know as uh, out of the gates essentially uh, on top of that uh, it's an there's an interesting thing to look at as well because uh, uh, although the piece only mentions product issues uh, there was a session at Music Tank on Monday night where uh, uh, one of the uh, you know Simon Wheeler who's the head of strategy at, at the Baggers Group one of the biggest independent labels in the world uh, mentioned that he knows for sure sure that YouTube doesn't have all the deals they, they need uh, yet uh, and hinting perhaps with his uh, certainty uh, to the fact that uh, they don't have a deal with them yet and so you know of course that's a, a big gaping hole in the catalog if uh, uh, they haven't managed to get a deal with Baggers or with any with with uh, some other uh, of the big labels uh, big independent labels uh, I mean uh, and so um, on that front, uh, you know, I'm pretty interested in, in, in your thoughts uh, around uh, YouTube in, in your respective territories as well. So, uh, Nick, uh, as far as Australia is concerned, uh, you know, is YouTube as, as present as it is, of course, uh, here in, in the UK and in the US? I imagine it is. And if so, what is your take on YouTube and a potential music service? Uh, would you welcome it or are you worried that, you know, that would just consolidate uh, YouTube's dominant position and reduce the bargaining power of, of uh, labels in the process? Uh, look, uh, look. I, I think we definitely welcome it. We, we've sort of worked hard to welcome the other streaming services, more out of pragmatism than anything else. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I guess if Simon's saying that he knows for sure that they haven't done all their deals and he's talking about the Beggars Group or, or, or the Merlin thing, which Beggars is obviously kind of one of the, the shining lights amongst their catalogue. Um, and if they haven't done a deal, then, um, you know, no service is complete without, like, the kind of the huge and rich catalogue of those indies. Yeah. Um, doesn't matter how early you do the deal with the majors, you just can't compete with the other services unless you go right down the long tail and get the good stuff because that's how you actually differentiate yourself. Yeah. Um, so I reckon it's, you know, I, 
I would speculate that that is the number one reason why it hasn't launched yet. It's, not, it's probably got nothing nothing at all to do with the fact that they're looking to do, um, you know, slideshow imaging and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Jasper, uh, last year there was a pretty uh, interesting sort of tie-up with, with YouTube as part of Music Matters. There was a sort of a YouTube Awards going on at the same time. And, uh, and so how do you view uh, the YouTube presence uh, in uh, Asia? And uh, of course, you know, a YouTube music service could be pretty compelling uh, in those territories too, where there isn't uh, such, a, such a big breadth of choice as there is uh, here in Europe or in the US. Yeah, look, I, I think um, <clears throat> the first thing you need to remember is Asia is not Asia. It's 28 different countries. Exactly. Um, and so it's very, it's very hard to talk about one homogenous mass, and I, and I include Australia in that. Um, the, the, for the work that we do with YouTubers, and these are you know, the, the stars themselves who have their own channels, so whether they're musicians or chefs or comedians or, com or, or, or lifestyle uh, vloggers, what, what we have seen since we did the YouTube Fan Fest last year, uh, and we've since done Singapore, Hong Kong, and, and Mumbai, is, is that the influence that these kids have over their fans is, is second to none. It's, it's unlike anything I've ever seen in the advertising industry or the entertainment industry in 25 years. Yeah. That, that, and that's very exciting if you can harness that. So, so if, you then, if you then put that into context of a music play, and you've got kids all over Asia who are genuinely using YouTube as their uh, source for new knowledge. It's the new radio DJ, I guess. Um, then, then if they can get the service right, and I, and, I buy, and I buy into what Nick was saying, but if they can get the service right, then, then it, it can only be good for the music industry and, and, and then ideally for the musicians themselves because of YouTube's fantastically disruptive revenue model. Sure, absolutely. And so, yeah, we're going to see what happens with that. I, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing the service when it comes out. Uh, it, it is uh, an interesting thing to see, you know, no matter how late YouTube is to the game, I think they will always make a big splash in the market just because of the position they have. Uh, but they have struggled to... Uh, get subscribers for their you know, trial of, of premium channels, essentially, that, that were requiring subscription. So it's going to be interesting to see how they drive that transition from uh, a service that is seen as being a completely free service to trying to drive uh, a, some sort of payment system, whether that's uh, uh, you know, the usual 9.99 that everybody else is charging or whether that's uh, a, a lower price point, we don't know. But uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, do you think, Jasper, that uh, the price point is going to be a key part of, of, of YouTube's process because of, uh, of the way people see the service, I guess? Yeah, I mean, again, using this horrible word, Asia, uh, so many Asian countries, uh, thanks, to, thanks to piracy through the 90s and... Right. Uh, sorry, through through the the you know the noughties, um regard music as free, albeit that services like Spotify and Deezer, um, and local services like KKBox are really doing a lot to to bring subscription services to the to the fore. Um, c can YouTube charge? Um, I think they'd be able to in some markets. I think uh, you know the more uh, um, developed territories such as Hong Kong and Singapore would be more open, and Taiwan and Korea. Japan would be more open to subscription-based models over markets like India um, uh, or, 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 uh, or, or China. I mean, they're not in China, but India and China where, yeah. where, where you're going to struggle. Yeah, sure. And, and Nick, uh, in Australia, we've seen a, a you know a flooding of uh, of streaming services in the last year or so. We're going to talk about that in a little bit more depth when we talk about Australia uh, in a little bit. But do, do you think that YouTube is just uh, another service that comes comes into the fold, or uh, can it really have a, have an impact on the market? Yeah, look, I I, I guess they've got as much chance as everyone else. Um, right. And you know, we saw we saw these uh, sort of shut up offers here recently, which. Um, you know, in my mind, is not particularly surprising. They all entered at the same time. They rushed, um, and uh, but you know, it's the services that have you know, um, I guess, taken a little bit of time and and really put some thought and strategy behind the launch are the ones that are being strong in the market right now. Yeah. So Spotify, by virtue of its just overall presence, is doing you know seems to be doing well, and Audio is is definitely being the most aggressive from a marketing and PR campaign here. Yeah. Um, uh, and was the first to launch. Um, the others, there's a few major label-based ones, um, which which just you know I, I guess has barely made an impact. Yeah. Um, um, I don't think Deezer made an impact. And I also 
you know, I wonder, I, I do wonder how YouTube is going to differentiate itself from, from anything else. Um, you know, uh, th their advantage is that they've been able to provide so much content to consumers for free. And um, I just don't understand how that's going to translate um, to a streaming service, you know, unless it's a, um, an ad, ad based ad revenue model. Um, yeah. And perhaps that's their plan. In which case, it'll probably work quite well, um, Jasper, um, in in those territories that we were talking about, um, you know, China and, and India, where consumers aren't used to paying. Yeah, sure, of course. But they're not used to paying, but they are, they have got, you know, YouTube have got. Look, look I, I, I've got to pro, you know, preface this. I'm a fan, right? I, I I think what YouTube are doing are fantastic, but but um, uh, they've got huge reach in, into Non, well, they're not in China, but but you know, places like India, Indonesia, Singapore, and it's not just the reach; it's the it's the amount of watch time that they're getting from kids as well. Kids are yeah. they're tuning into YouTube; they're not watching TV. So so you've got to say that that, that from a although that although they're they're late to market, they've still got a an amazing kind of I couldn't say head start, but they've got they they've got amazing reach to launch. They're not. They're not starting at ground zero. Sure, and, and it's it's uh, it's a very interesting, multifaceted issue here with YouTube, and I think the interest the industry has got a love hate relationship with with YouTube. Although every time that a debate comes up, at least in the last few months, uh, uh, that is, uh, is around streaming, it feels like. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, labels are, uh, you know, veering on the side of Spotify and other streaming services uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, being a little bit more cautious when it comes to YouTube because they're not seeing the revenues that they are uh, hoping or expecting to see from a site that has got such a, such a big reach. So uh, definitely uh, interesting to see how the relationship between YouTube and the industry is going to progress over the next uh, few months and whether the conversation is going to shift when it comes to also industry panels and industry conversations uh, uh, around the world. We're going to look out for what happens at uh, uh, music matters, of course, and a big sound as well later in the year. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. talking about uh, uh, sort of large uh, multinational corporations, I wanted to touch upon uh, a news coming from Vivendi. Uh, so Vivendi has uh, finally announced the sale of its SFR business in France uh, to uh, Numericable, which beat uh, a three uh, to the bidding process. Uh, and, uh, you know, the sale is worth over $22 billion. Uh, and uh, this is an interesting sale for the music industry because it uh, stresses uh, and it reinforces Vivendi's commitment towards uh, its uh, media and content uh, uh, properties and in particular universal music which is a uh, sort of its uh, uh, prized uh, possession uh, and uh, uh, you know that uh, alongside a few other of, of the big businesses that uh, uh, Vivendi has at the moment and so uh, uh, you know I think it's an interesting uh, sale it's a lot of money coming into Vivendi from it and I'm wondering how that's going to be invested and whether that's going to in any way be invested back into Universal for acquiring, for example, other media properties. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, is, is there a way f for you guys, for Universal to keep expanding, I guess, uh, horizontally uh, rather than vertically in the sense that trying to get involved in more... Uh, sideline uh, parts of the business uh, like live for example getting more involved, involved in that because I feel like if they try to acquire anybody else there's going to be a massive fuss around the market share and so that's going to be very hard for them but if they try and expand in different areas that might be a possibility for the company. Uh, uh, Jasper what are your thoughts on that? Yeah what, one of the themes that came out of um, Music Masses last year and um, was was the, the the very real fact that music isn't the biggest leisure pastime in, on the planet anymore? It's gaming, right. um, and and therefore for the music industry to grow, let alone survive, but to grow, they have to start collaborating. And it's not it's not the other industries now knocking on their door. The music industry's got to go the other way, and they've got to start you know wearing their their the shoe leather out the paper. Um, and, and, and going and banging on the gaming doors and, and, yeah. and the, the, the movie doors and stuff. So, uh, I, and I think that the, the Unile Universal are, are set up as, I mean, in, in such scale uh, all over the world to do that. I think a Asia is an interesting one for them because they've got a, a, a fantastic guy at the helm uh, for Southeast Asia who's very, very progressive and very, very, um, you know, th thinks very, very out of the box. So they are, I know that they are looking at Doing lots of new different um, collaborations and, and 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 you know diversifying their interests into other areas. So yeah. I think it's really I think to be in the music industry right now is is jet. I mean I've got a slide in a presentation that we do. It just says you know um, it's got the Pointer Sisters on it and it just says we're so excited yeah. because 
the only way is up, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Nick, uh, yeah. from your end, from, from an independent perspective, uh, what do you think, you know, of course, uh, the fact that Vivendi is prepared to invest in content uh, and, in, in, you know, in, in their media assets in this way is fantastic. And the fact that they're concentrating on that, uh, it's, it's not a bad sign. At the same time, I guess uh, there, there might be some unease uh, from the independent sector to see the, the possibility of Universal becoming even bigger than it is now. Yeah, sure. I, I, I can't see how they would... Um, be able to purchase more, given given yeah. the um, uh, the divestments that they are forced to do when they when you know they purchased EMI. Um, you know, it's an interesting stage, so so they have to look for other ways to grow. Um, and you know, you know, I think Jasper's point. I wouldn't that wouldn't have been the first thought that came to me, but it probably should have been. Um, you know, the, investing in, in growing um, growing models is something. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, that's that's what they'll end up doing. Um, yeah, and you know, live, live is still a pretty open space. Like, there's still a, a room to get into the live industry in one way or another. Yeah, look, look, I guess so. I mean, um, that that that's an interesting model, um, and you know, it, it's it, it depends how they go about doing it. I guess, um, you know, I mean, I mean, if it if it furthers their their kind of involvement and their reliance on on kind of 360 deals with artists, I don't think that's a good thing for for anyone really. Um, but if they're, they're setting up entire new kind of silos of the company, I, you know, I, I, I guess that's what exactly what they're going to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on this and see see where this uh, 22 billion uh, ends up. And uh, uh, um, I uh, want to talk about Gracenote. Gracenote announced a partnership with Deezer to bring the streaming services track IDs into their uh, Gracenote Rhythm database. And I caught up with Ty Roberts, uh, Gracenote's co-founder and CTO. So here it is. Well, it's a real pleasure today on the Digital Music Trends show to welcome Ty Roberts, CTO at GraceNote. So hi, Ty, and thanks for making the time. How's it going today? It's going great. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. It's great to have you. And so uh, I want to uh, talk about the partnership with Deezer first up. So uh, what was that all about and how did it uh, come up? Um, so, uh, uh, you know, basically what's going on is that uh, obviously we've been participating in a lot of different hackathons that are going on around the world. Um, Music Hack Day is one of the ones I think we've done in a couple different locations. I think maybe that was the third one or fourth one we've done. Um, and the idea really is to try to get the developers to work with GraceNotes APIs and our partners' APIs to create some new experiences. That's fantastic. And, yeah, and this one, uh, Deezer is one of the guys that uh, we're working with here. We've been working with them for a while. And, uh, of course, they have a you know pretty large global catalog. So we were able to ingest their catalog, match it with our giant catalog of music and then make the IDs that connect things into Deezer's world available to the developers. That's great. So they, so, kind of so they can connect to the, the two things, right, on a practical level. That's correct. Yeah, basically, you know, if you think about it, we have kind of like different kinds of identification technology. So you can, you know, hold up your phone and identify music playing in the air. That then leads to identification. And then as one of the things that comes back, the Deezer ID would be there, which you can then use to create a playlist or to do something with the, the Deezer APIs. That's awesome. And these have been uh, uh, very much involved in, in, in getting developers to use their API. And that's definitely an interesting tool in their, in their arsenal. And so, uh, you know, on, on talking about uh, the Grace Note Rhythm product, of course, uh, uh, you know, how is that coming along? And have you been flooded by calls since uh, the acquisition of the Aconest uh, <laughs> from Spotify? Well, yes, I'd have to say we, we, a lot of people have been expressing interest. Um, but we had a lot of interest even before that, because I think that the uh, the, the main thing there is that it's powered by GraceNotes, you know, giant database, which I think is, I don't know, something like 180 million tracks right now. Right. And that, that global database basically feeds in there, and it really lets somebody create a global uh, radio product that seems, I'll call it local, even though it's global. Yeah. And um, uh, so the, the, what's been coming along there is we've literally working with the first initial deployments right now. A few of the partners are, you know, starting to develop on it. Um, the... I think the product itself uh, will hopefully will have some uh, some of these partners in the in the marketplace in a few months with this running, and uh, the feedback's been been great. I mean, basically, um, I think what people are excited about is the uh, I guess the breadth of different kinds of music it works with, and the again it works with music in all kinds of different places and languages and things like that. Yeah, sure. And uh, looking at uh, the partnerships with uh, with the uh, data companies like uh, Music Metric and, and Next Big Sound, so how do they fit into the picture of Grace Not uh, Rhythm? 
Um, so how do they fit in? So we want to, we have all kinds of different data partnerships. I think right now, Grace, I get something like, I don't know, 2,000 feeds from all kinds of different partners all over the world or from different things. And so these uh, analytics companies really are providing a different kind of sensing data to us. They're finding out what's happening on Twitter, for example, or maybe what's happening in uh, people are searching for different things. And they pull together all kinds of different analytics to kind of help us find the hot trending artists who are not yet hitting the sales curve. Like, yeah. you know, what's the newest, hottest things that are coming out? Who's really getting some? And so that kind of information will feed into our, our product so that when you make a playlist, for example, with the, with the rhythm product or whatever, you'll get new artists in there as well as the ones you might expect. And uh, that will be very differentiating. I mean, one thing people say about some of the other radio services that are out there is the playlist seems extremely narrow, and there's never anything new, hardly ever, in there. It's uh, it's almost like you know exactly who's going to come up almost before you play it. Yeah. And yeah. maybe that was good for the first versions of these products because consumers have reacted good to that. But now people want more, a little more depth. They want a little more local color. They want a little bit newer stuff. And so we're really trying to use these analytics companies to help bring that to us. Awesome. And, and in a sense, uh, it's interesting to see, you know, Grace Not Rhythm as a separate product, but it's also something that uh, with all the data you're gathering through that, that's also going to improve the, the Grace Not, to pro the, you know, the core Grace Not product, right? That's correct. And for example, let me just give you some ideas. So obviously we have a, you know, we have a recognition technology. It's, you know, similar in function to what Shazam has, although we, we do kind of a, for our partners like Sony and Sony Ericsson. Yeah. That product requires there to be servers loaded with content ahead of time so that you can identify it. And we can't load everything in our entire database in there because that would be too hard to search through everything. So we kind of want to, but we want to focus on the latest things that are trending because, of course, that's the things people don't know and that's what they might be actually trying to identify. If they're trying to identify the Beatles, we've got that. <laughs> but the reality is, what's the new band that's just coming out? Yeah. And this kind of trending data will help us get that stuff to the kind of the front of those servers so it could be recognized quickly. That's and that might not be there based upon sales because some of these artists, frankly, are YouTube artists or people who aren't even really necessarily even selling music in the traditional channels yet. Yeah. And finally, I, I, I always want to end by talking about the API itself. So uh, is it easy to try out? And if there are developers listening to the show, uh, what, what's the best way to do that? Uh, well, first of all, they can just go to gracenote.com and there's an open developer link right on there and they can go to that open developer site. All they have to do is like they have to sign up a little click wrap license and they have immediate access. Um, and there's help on there and there's documentation and there's people that can, can help them. And so essentially the idea is that I think a lot of APIs of Grace Notes are available through that, that service, both for music and for television, yeah. as well as some kind of new technologies we haven't even really put in the market yet. So it's kind of a little playground for the smart developers to go and explore, and I heartily encourage them to do that. That's awesome. Well, Ty, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. And so, guys, uh, uh, talking about uh, Grace Note, uh, Deezer, and, and sort of the, the bigger data plays, uh, are you seeing a lot of movement, uh, Jasper, when it comes to music matters, uh, you know, looking at uh, uh, sort of data issues and, and getting companies to talk about that? So, you know, that's a topic that uh, has definitely uh, caught fire since the Aconest acquisition uh, last month. Uh, and so is that reflected in what you're looking at for, for the conference, too? Yeah, look, we, we've, been, we've been close to the, to the Grace Note guys uh, since the first year, I think we did Music Matters. That's nine years ago, um, and it's amazing what they've done. And and and, and the, you know, it's great to see the passion that they have. I mean, you know, Ty Ty is the ultimate nerd, but you know, how much passion does he have in the music industry? It's 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 fantastic, and and, and the world needs more people like him. Um, we we do focus a lot. We've got a metadata workshop this year coming. We've got a we've also got an analytics workshop for the, on the digital matters program. Awesome. Where we'll be talking much more about you know kind of programming programming numbers rather than rather than creatively. Yeah. Um, you know, the kind of the Netflix story. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's it's huge. But we're, we we've. Uh, we always have metadata playing a large role in, in, the, in the program. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Nick, uh, on your front, uh, do you see uh, this kind of uh, talk around uh, uh, data and, and music data APIs uh, becoming uh, an interesting part of, of Big Sound uh, later this year? Yeah, certainly we do. Um, you know, it's a big part for, for us as an indie label representation as well. Um, it's definitely one, probably the biggest focus we have as, a, as an organization working with small labels right now is locking down, um, you know, every everyone's behavior with metadata. Yeah. Um, 
uh, and and you see it time and time again. You see it from people that should know much much better that, that you know the way they treat their data is, is not pure, and it makes mistakes and it costs them money in the long term. Yeah, I mean even even as far as looking at you know some of the more simple aspect aspects of, of metadata, you know talking about. The, the ISRC and, and the way that it's self-governed um, by different associations around the world. There's no there's no central database, yeah. um, you know, uh, and and it's really up to every individual label to keep their ISRCs in check, in order. Um, and um, and then as soon as you go across, um, you, as soon as you start licensing into other territories, um, you, you see distributors, you know. Um, you know, assigning their own ISRC. So all of a sudden, depending on where you're listening to the music, you're getting one or two ISRCs. And, you know, it, it just causes a lot of problems. It's something Absolutely. that really has to be be fixed. Um, and that, I mean, you know, that's just one example. But in the end, given that the entire music industry is based on data, um, uh, you know, if we don't have ways to properly um, mark and identify music, um then the end user, um, and particularly the small guy, is going to miss out in a big way. They're going to, that money will end up in black holes, yeah. and usually, depend. Usually, those black holes are um, sort of administered by you know various collection societies where the major stake stakeholders are the majors, and they'll collect that money. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, what you're saying makes complete sense, and it's kind of going back to the uh, question marks that uh, uh, I heard uh, at South by Southwest around the Global Repertoire Database Project, the GRD, uh, which seems to have hit some roadblocks as the com some of the companies that uh, had. Uh, pledge to uh, fund the project are now backtracking and say that they don't want to uh, uh, spend money on, on that, which is uh, a real shame because you know the GRD uh, could be really the key to unlocking uh, the metadata from from the world when it comes to music and actually making sense of licensing rights. And the question is why why wouldn't they fund it? I mean, you know, I, I have to imagine that it's it's based on self interest. Is that they realise that um, once these things get aligned, they're probably once people really understand the exact way music is used, um, it might not be so good. Then then they're forced to pay um, royalties the way they should, rather than making inferences from charts or or radio data or whatever that might be. Yeah. Um, so that's really disappointing. I mean, it, it's it's an inevitability that it. Old guy hopes and have the ability that we, we have the technology to, to really um, to track where royalties are due, you know, whatever type of royalty it is. Um, but it has to be instigated, yeah. um, and it does need some people to invest. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, so um, that's an interesting story. We'll, we'll keep an eye on it. But uh, uh, moving on from that, uh, Jasper, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, uh, music matters uh, this year. So how is it shaping up? And uh, is there uh, any particular themes that you are uh, focusing on in, 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 in especially? Uh, hello, Vicky. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm taking notes, I'm taking notes, Jasper. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, the Big Sound program is, is it was awesome last year. So uh, I think we've got friendly fire. Um, it's um, the the uh, you know it's our ninth year. We we have a, a program which is now takes in digital entertainment, music matters, and and a thing called social matters, which was a, a joint venture we have with the ad agency group Ogilvy, right? Um, which is all about brands teaching brands about how they're socialising themselves, but. But all, all three of the programs are really focusing in on, on what makes great content and what makes great content that's shareable, and then how do you share it. And, and I think for, for the music industry, from what we're seeing, they've been overtaken by a number of other industries in this ability to share. Um, a lot of the band, you know, we've got 70 bands coming to the festival this year, and one of the things we've asked for, for the first time is, is their social metrics. Uh, because we want the bands that don't have social metrics to understand they need social metrics. If you yeah. don't have, if you don't socialize, you die. Um, and so one of the big themes I I this year is that content really does matter. Um, the, the, the other theme uh, going through this for the, on the music side of things is that if you're in a band, you're in a business. Right. Uh, we, we launched our Music Masters Academy last year, which was, which was a great event. It was 150 musicians, invitation only, so they didn't pay to be there. And they got to they got to meet you know real people in the real music industry doing real things. And the first question they were asked was, "Where's your business?" 
Yeah. I all walked into this room thinking like, hey, I'm in a band, I've got tattoos, I'm really cool. And then they're asked for a business plan, and they're like, oh, we don't have a business plan, we're in a band, we're really cool. We, you know, we're, and, and it's like, no, you're in a business, and the CEO is the singer, and the COO is the drummer, and the, where's your business plan? Yeah. And so we taught them how to at least uh, define what success looks like to them. Do they want to be the biggest band in India? Do they want to be the biggest jazz band in China? Do they want to be the biggest band in the world? Do they want to be the new Lady Gaga? Yeah. And if once they've got that vision, and once they've aligned and agreed within their band, or if they're you know on that vision, then it's like, how do you get from A to Z? Uh, sorry, what did I say? Z? <laughs> Z? <laughs> how do you get from A to Z? Um, and, and, and that's a business plan. And, and yeah. by the end of the two days, these kids came out just with their minds, they, they were blown away. And, and, right. and so that's another thing that we're going to continue on with this. Is if you're in a band, you're in a business. That's awesome. And so where can people find more information about, about the, the festival there? Uh, we've now, we've renamed it All That Matters, which I think yeah. is a little bit um, slightly overclaiming. Um, but, you know, to have music, digital and social plus yeah. the YouTube fan fest, um, it's allthatmatters.asia. Perfect. And so, Nick, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Australia as well before we talk about Big Sound. So uh, we've been That's covering right. Australia quite a bit on the show in the last few weeks because of the numbers that came out uh, from the AIFPI, uh, which uh, were showing, uh, uh, you know, a, a definite decline in uh, music sales. You know, it was, it was a quarter decline, a 25 percent decline uh, year on year for uh, physical. And uh, uh, there was also an overall uh, decline uh, for the uh, for the market, of course, uh, digital. Uh, is growing, although the um, uh, you know downloads uh, stabilized with a growth of only 0.5 percent, uh, and uh, streaming is of course uh, the big story because it, it almost doubled. Uh, and it makes up close to six percent of the overall pie, but six percent is only six percent, so it's not it's not huge yet. So uh, from your side, uh, how have you seen this uh, drop, uh, uh, which has been uh, steeper than we've seen uh, on the physical front in, in most other territories around the world uh, for 2013? How has that impacted uh, the indie sector? And uh, uh, what can you see for 2014 uh, in terms of uh, uh, streaming helping offset uh, uh, that, uh, that decline and whether that's going to uh, be able to catch up in terms of revenues to what's, what's being lost on, on the physical market? Yeah, look, I think that, that when those stats came out, I was actually surprised and right. disappointed. I, I, I didn't. I, I thought a little while ago, a couple of years ago, that we were about to see it plateau and, and perhaps even rise the overall revenues. Um, you know, and when I look at the data now, um, which I have in front of me, um, the I guess what I found most disappointing is the um, not so much the decline in revenues, but the decline in 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 just quantities, yeah. um, you know, you can always, you know, there's there's lots of things that go towards the, the reduction, you know, just the general devaluation of, of, of copyrighted product and even, you know, CDs are, are selling for less these days and stuff like that. So, you know, that's disappointing and there's lots of factors um, and some of those factors are as simple as, um, you know, we have one huge physical retailer that, yeah. that sort of dominates the market here. Um, and if the, they change their policies and start realizing that they're, they're, they're clearly making more money selling DVDs and white goods than they are CDs, and they give it less shelf space um, yeah. and less opportunity for a consumer to buy. So um, there's factors outside of, of, you know, there are conditions to do with local retail and the local retail environment which add to this. Yeah. Um, you know, I think when, when we look at, you know, it's disappointing that you see a reduction in, in digital tracks being sold. You know, we would have hoped that that was a huge um, increase. But, you know, those that sort of stuff changes between um, year to year based on who releases a hit song. Right. And, you know, when you have a year in 2012, for example, when Gaultier released a huge single and, you know, just, just it, it sold so much at home, um, you know, and worldwide, and then we didn't have a local hit like that the next year. So that's enough to account for that. Yeah. Um, so you know, I'm inclined to look at the positives and go, well, at least you know, streaming is picking up. Um, we're seeing the ad supporter models, you know, like doing pretty well. Um, but it, it's still small fry, and yeah. a lot of people here like to talk about the vinyl explosion. But but you know that is still small fry too. We're talking like five percent of the industry. It's not yeah. enough to make a huge difference. Sure. Um, and have you seen that? Uh, like, thing, this, oh, yeah. oh, sorry, no, go ahead. Go ahead. 
No, no. One thing I, I just I, I always like to talk about when when it comes to streaming and the way it very very tangibly affects the independent labels, um, which I think is not talked about because we have these discussions. We're talking about huge on on a macro level the, the trends, but. Um, what happens is that if you're a small label and you're releasing, you know, two, three albums a year, perhaps, um, you, you know, let's say in the old days you might invest, you know, twenty thousand dollars on something like that, and no, you know, fairly safe assumption that within six months um, you're going to recoup that money. Um, you, you probably only have to sell three or four thousand uh, records to do that. Um, then um, uh, now. Um, the streaming services quite rightly say that eventually you'll make more money. Yeah. Um, you know, eventually for, for, for every sale that you used to make, you that was a once-off transaction. Now you get millions of transactions and it will, 8 to 10 to 15 years' time, recoup. I guess the issue is that if you're not dealing with huge catalogue, yeah. you know, no, no artist or, or small record label could possibly run a good business when it takes them 15 years to recoup and reinvest on the next release. You know, you need to churn product. And that's where the biggest danger um, is for small labels and streaming services is that you just simply don't... It's just changed the cash flow model completely, Yeah. Um, which is, you know, I, I guess makes life very, very hard for the indies in, in the new business. Yeah, absolutely. And that makes complete sense uh, looking at also the figures that are coming out of the US. Uh, last night, uh, Nielsen SoundScan uh, posted their Q1 results for the US uh, showing that uh, uh, the streaming business is doing great. Uh, you know, uh, in Q1, uh, streams jumped by, by 9 billion to 34.28 billion streams compared to the same quarter last year. And also the average sum paid per stream rose. Uh, you know, the average rate going, f going from 0.035 uh, uh, to 0.05 uh, dollars, uh, which means that it would take around 2,000 streams to make the same money you'd make from a wholesale release. And to your point, Nick, you know, 2,000 streams uh, is a hell of a lot of streams uh, for a wholesale release, uh, 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 considering how many you'd have to get uh, to uh, to recoup uh, those $20,000 you were talking about. It would take uh, quite a while for an artist that is still in, in a development stage. Uh, and uh, um, the, the other thing I wanted to ask you, Nick, it was uh, about the size of the market, because Australia is, has remained the sixth uh, market in the world. Uh, but uh, in terms of number, it's by far the smallest uh, in terms of population uh, country in that list. So it's 22 million people, and that's a number that I like to point out when I talk about Australia, because it, it feels like that the shift between physical uh, sales and streaming could it could be even more abrupt in the sense that you have a very a, a fairly small population that is really into music and buys a lot of music that's why you're the sixth market in the world and i think you were fifth at one point uh, uh, and if if a lot of those music lovers uh, shift gradually from or uh, you know fa fairly quickly from uh, buying a, lo a lot of physical uh, CDs to uh, streaming a lot of tracks, uh, that's going to impact the territory more than in, in other uh, parts of the world where there's a, a pretty vast uh, uh, number of people who are sort of into music but they don't spend a lot of money on it. Uh, do, do you think that's a fair, a fair comment to make? Yeah, yeah, I think if you look at it, um and, and maybe maybe this backs up your answer, um, given the other kind of territory to make news from that IFP report with Japan. Um, but if you look at those IFP lists, lists and look at the investment per capita in music, I think Australia comes second. Um, uh, you know, um, we're talking, you know, a, a reasonable, you know, twenty five dollars, twenty five Australian dollars, which is maybe twenty, twenty two, twenty three um, US dollars a year you know, per capita spent on the music. And and it's quite interesting when you talk to, to people, you know, you know, speaking to people from the Beggars Group, for example, from an indie perspective, they, they view Australia as a strong market um, yeah. and a, a really good, uh, it, it represents a really good return on investment for, for their marketing dollar because yeah. people do buy. Um, we have a few issues. One of them is that, you know, just our geographically it's a huge country and we just don't quite have the infrastructure to have super fast internet connection um, and so a slightly slower uptake maybe on digital services than it would be if you had great speeds and, and that kind of stuff yeah um, and maybe and maybe Jasper could talk to this a little bit you know when you look at, at countries that really have got their ducks in a row in terms of digital infrastructure and I, I'm sort of talking specifically about Korea which is a, an interesting 
territory and, and the way that they've embraced the digital services and their very fast um, sort of incline up the ladder of valuable music territories. Yeah. Uh, Jasper, any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, again, where do you want to start? There's 28 of them, but, but <laughs> yeah. To start Specifically with Korea. about Korea, though, yeah. Korea, Korea is an amazing uh, place, and, and, and you know, obviously, the, with the, with the fact that they're now starting to export their music as the first kind of proper Asian territory to do that, uh, it just gets very interesting indeed. But but they they they're, they're they're you know at least six or seven years now into a having a legitimate streamed industry um, a, a, online industry, so. A lot of people used to come and still do come to Music Matters to learn from Korea and Japan and you know, markets where, where they, they, they have a sophisticated uh, industry. I just have one little postscript on the Australian situation. Um, uh, Max Hole, the, uh, the president of, of Universal Music Worldwide, who, who is going to be at Music Matters, there's a little plug, uh, he, he got quoted as... <laughs> as saying the reason the Australian music industry dipped was because they were doing so well in the cricket against in England. And, uh, there's, there's no Ashes series next year, so everyone will go out and buy music again. Um, probably but true. look, you know, I, I, think, I think the world can learn a lot from, from countries like Korea. I also think they can learn a lot from countries like China, ironically, right. where you know, piracy, IFPI listed China as 99% piracy last year. Um, but there are, you know, if, if you're in a successful music business in China, even if it's a part of another service, part of another business, um, there's got to be some stuff to learn from from them if they can survive in such a such a, an aggressive aggressive pirate, pirated market. Yeah, and definitely it's going to be interesting to hear uh, add uh, add Petro's insights as well on that because uh, he's been running a business there for a few years, so uh, from out out the street, right? <laughs> Yeah, look, Ed's, 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 Ed's someone, he's a case in point of how to do business in China. The first, right. He won't mind me saying this, the, the first time Ed, Ed Pito went to China, uh, he, he, he turned up and said, this is what worked for me in London, I'm going to do it in Beijing. And six months later, he was back in Hong Kong licking his wounds saying, I f***ed up, I got it wrong. <laughs> yeah. But he then, he changed his model and, and he moved with the country and, and now he's doing really, really well. And so, you know, uh, you know it's, it's, it's good for him. I know, I know we've just... Um, 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 diverse a little bit from the top. So, you know, yeah, I'll give him. Sorry, I'll sorry, give him a free plug. I was <laughs> just shocked that you swore. Um, this is going to have to be one of those. One of those one of those podcasts on iTunes with a little ex ex uh, explicit box now. Uh, uh, Nick, sorry, just to go back to Big Sound, can you just tell us uh, quickly yep. uh, what, what that's all about in case people are interested in, in it and, and how they can get more information on that? Uh, yeah, certainly. I mean, Big Sound, um, it does differ a little bit from from Music Matters in, in that, um, you know, our focus is very... is, is incredibly focused on the Australian live industry and, and, and the artists. It's much more, I think, artist focused than business focused. Yeah. Um, and so what we have in Australia is probably, you know, one of the, the kind of richer A&R grounds um, in the world right now. And um, there's a lot of great up and coming uh, professionals in Australia that, that are needing to deal with these kind of these mid-level buyers all over the world. It's my job to, to um, to get people to understand that you know, if you want to deal with someone like you know an artist like Flume or the Preachers or um, Jaguar Ma or Courtney Barnett, these are all people that are playing Coachella this weekend. They're all people that are kind of launching on a stream uh, on, a, on a worldwide basis. That coming out here and talking to our promoters and our labels and stuff um, is is actually important to visit the territory rather than to wait for them to come around to you because generally that's too late. Sure. Um, and then in terms of, you know, it, it def it's the entire Australian industry. It's the sixth biggest industry in the world. Um, and it, uh, it's a vibrant event. It's in Brisbane. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a really good party. Um, we focus as much on kind of entertainment and, and the art of music as we do on the education and business of music. Sure. Uh, and um, you can find out all the information you need at www.bigsound.org.au. 
Awesome. Perfect. Uh, that's, it's uh, thanks the, so much. Andrea, I don't, I don't know if you've been to it, but it is a genuinely awesome event. Nice. Um, it's everything Nick said, and I think there's more of that as well. Yeah. It's we, a long way from it, London. Uh, that's the only thing. <laughs> uh, it's not that far. It's easy. You take, take a chemical upgrade on the way, and you'll be fine. But, <laughs> but the, um, the, the, look, when, when we were down there, we, we go every year. I, I was down there two years ago, um, and I got to meet with a lot of really cool band managers uh, who were genuinely interested in... in uh, alter op opportunities for their artists that weren't the traditional America or, or UK. Yeah. Um, and they've realized that there are markets like Indonesia with 240 million people that are four hours north of Darwin. Um, and, and I have to say, since, since Big Sound, the number of bands we have coming to Music Matters has doubled. That's awesome. And, and I've got to say that's, that's down to the, the great work that Nick and, and the guys are doing there because uh, it, it, it gave us exposure to... A market it gave the market exposure to us and it's just been a win-win ever since amazing that's mm. great and yeah i have yeah, heard great reports from friends as well uh, i know david adams was uh, from soundcloud was at uh, uh, the event a couple of years ago or yeah. even last year not a couple of years ago i think uh, and he he yeah. loved it absolutely loved it so he definitely recommended it and uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, awesome stuff and yeah. uh, well, one thing i just just sure. quick one thing i i do have to say no um and and the reason i for any listeners to go or any listeners to when they meet Australians for a plug of our, our country's business um, is that the, the market is even at the investment level or even at the level we were talking about it's just too small to sustain a living as a musician yeah. um, um, so we are forced by nature to export um, yeah. and that's you know that's why when Jasper sort of provides this platform to to, to go in and investigate options uh, and, and opportunities through Asia we do it by by nature um, and so um, you know and that's what you have access to these people that are incredibly hungry to go over the world and usually working with businesses or catalogs or artists that are, are ready yeah yeah awesome well uh, a couple of uh, stories to finish the show today so first of all i'm gonna uh, show you a, a quick recording of an interview i did with uh, uh, paul springer uh, the svp of america and chief product officer at rhapsody that i recorded uh, just about six hours ago uh, on the pst time uh, talking about the company's uh, latest progress report and uh, uh, expansion which was a, a big news item of this week so here it goes it's a real pleasure to welcome to the show uh, paul springer svp of of Americas and Chief Product Officer at uh, Rhapsody. So hi, Paul, and thanks for joining me on the show. How's it going? Great to be here. Thanks. Everything is going well. Great. And so I wanted to talk about uh, the growth of uh, Rhapsody's subscriber base. You released some numbers uh, uh, just uh, uh, yesterday. So uh, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So we announced that we're just now north of 1.7 million paying subscribers on a global basis. We're now operating in 32 countries, up from about three a um, year and a half ago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's been crazy. Uh, outside of the U.S., we operate under the Napster brand, and in the U.S., we operate as the Rhapsody brand. Uh, but those growth numbers represent about 63% year-over-year growth in our paid subscriber base, and I think it was 16% uh, growth just in the last quarter alone. Wow. Um, so we're really seeing that we're at that inflection point and that now is the time uh, to, really, to really introduce streaming music uh, solutions to uh, subscribers on a global basis. Sure. So tell us a little bit about uh, how it all worked uh, as far as uh, the European and, and South American expansion uh, and, and uh, how, that, how that came along. Sure. So uh, about nine months ago, we announced uh, a global partnership with Telefonica. As part of that partnership, they had the uh, we basically became the preferred solution, music solution uh, that was available to their operating businesses. Um, obviously, each of the decisions around music and how music fits into the strategies um, is done at the individual operating business level. So there's no obligation for their operating businesses to work with. This. But we felt like we had a pretty compelling solution and an experience set that really gave them, um, you know, a great a great portfolio of choices that they could select on how they wanted to incorporate music into their into their uh, their own overall business strategies. So um, so this has resulted in partnerships with O2 in Germany, um, Vivo in Brazil, and across the rest of Latin America under the Movistar brand. Yeah. 
Um, and so we've done um, a handful of integrations thus far, more underway, uh, but primarily those integrations happen in one of two or three flavors. The first is just as a result of being a member uh, uh, or a subscriber at a given carrier, you can get a discounted rate on a music service. Yeah. Um, so that's fine. Um, then other people are actually starting to bundle the music solution in with the tariff um, itself. Um, and, um, and so that's, that's the other mechanism by which you can really, really introduce music streaming um, to a lar large audience. And so we're doing all of those right now, in addition to just being available in the app stores and, and allowing any retail consumer to sign up on Android, iOS, Windows Phone, Firefox OS, yeah. um, has launched yeah. in Brazil. Um, and so our, it, it basically aligns with our goal to basically put music uh, within arm's reach for any music fan around the world. Absolutely, and it's interesting also because in South America you find uh, that different territories have wildly different economies and also wildly different, uh, uh, you know, potential, you know, uh, disposable income uh, potential from from consumers, and so you really have to uh, calibrate there the price point or the price of entry for a streaming service, right? I think that's very that's very accurate. I mean, I think through this process and our expansion there. One of the di more dynamic conversations was between us and the labels around licensing rights and what are the price points that could be borne within uh, within each individual market, and that that varies, and it's a function of, you know, still it's a function of how prevalent piracy is in the market. Um, what you know, how prominent are the are the speeds for uh, for wireless data delivery uh, in each market? Um, so it also allowed us to innovate a little bit. We we've, we've introduced a weekly plan in, with Vivo in Brazil, primarily to get the price point down but also to align with with consumers and how they were how they were you know using their own products so I think this is the first week, weekly plan that exists out there in market and um, uh, you know and it helps us really get that price point down for consumers sure and so talking about consumption so of course mobile uh, you talked about how, how important that part of it is for the business uh, I want to ask you yep. about the, the living room you know we're, we're seeing so many boxes come out uh, uh, um, all of which, you know, they don't really have a huge amount of support for music, but I'm sure that's coming in, you know, in the next year or so. So, do you see mm -hmm. the living room as an important piece as well that in the future for for Rhapsody? Yeah, I mean, I mean, right now we tend to think of mobile as dominating all of the consumption and listening, but I think the next phase, whether it's connected devices in the, in the home, in the living room, or whether it's in the car, I think there's still a role to be played where mobile it still is the controller, even if the output or connection source might be something different. So just last week we announced Chromecast support for our, for our app. So, you know, for the, what's the cost of Chromecast? 35 bucks, you can now, right. Uh, right. you know, stream music to your TV, and if you've got great speakers hooked up uh, to your home uh, entertainment, system that's a great way for us to take a fragmented ecosystem and really streamline and deliver it there yeah. um, in yeah. the US we're also available on some of the consoles on the Xbox in particular um, and we'll continue you know our goal is we want to be wherever consumers want us to be um, we previously we've done integrations with all the major smart TV platforms and applications we didn't see a ton of uptake in that yeah. um, um, you know, it's a little bit of a, a you know version one experience of how people would consume music, yeah. and I think just using your TV remote to control music was just not not a natural behavior for people. But I think you know we'll keep investing, we'll keep iterating on that, yeah. um, and uh, you know I'm pretty sure that that uh, the home's important for us to figure out because that's where people want to listen to music. Yeah, and hopefully, um, you know, hopefully in the next few, few months we're going to see a, a slightly more codified experience as well because there's so many different manufacturers all requiring their own standard of app development and that's uh, so taxing for anybody trying to have a service on, on many different platforms. Yeah, I mean, we, we support right now, we support Chromecast, AirPlay for Apple, and AllPlay. So we announced uh, Qualcomm, I believe, is leading the standard there with AllPlay. Um, and so any connected speakers that are using the AllPlay chip will be able to be powered by Rhapsody and have you send your music from your phone directly into any of those connected speakers. And I think you'll see a lot more of that this holiday season and, and through next year. Um, it also should go to say that um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't note that at least in the U.S. and Europe, Sonos continues to be um, a primary platform by which early adopters individuals with higher disposable income seem to be wiring out, you know, cutting the cords with uh, their speakers 
and outfitting their home and really using Rhapsody to um, to power their Sonos experiences. We were the first streaming service on the Sonos platform, and it continues to be a material source of, uh, of subscriber usage for us. Awesome. And finally, uh, looking at the, sort of the next six months for the company, what are your key areas of focus? Uh, is there a particular territory that you're uh, concentrating on right now, or uh, are you still looking at uh, a continuous global expansion on that front? Yeah, I mean, we'll continue to expand globally. Um, we'll continue to drive, now that we've, we're live in each of those markets, we'll continue to drive both retail and partnerships uh, in those markets to drive growth. Um, and then we're going to continue to have a renewed focus on the U.S. I think, you know, this is our own backyard. It's more competitive than ever. You know, you're competing with free in the U.S. in ways that you're not necessarily doing in, in Europe or Latin America at this point. Um, and it's the most mature from um, from the number of partners and in industries that want to put music as part of a broader solution, whether they're an MVNO, a wireless carrier, or even just you know a retail consumer who's now you know awakened to the understanding. Oh, here's what's here. Yeah, I've heard of Pandora, but what's the difference between Pandora and Rhapsody? Well, now that they're being introduced to that, let me show them the full on-demand experience instead of a you know a limited experience. And so we're going to take a renewed focus in really trying to um, capture some of that 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 latent demand that, that's out there right now. Awesome. Well, Paul, thanks so much for your time, and look forward to having you back on the show soon. Great. Thanks, Andre. Uh, during Monday night's uh, Music Tank event on music streaming, uh, Simon Wheeler, who is Director of Strategy at the Baggers Group, announced uh, uh, that the independent label is going to revise its 50-50 policy on streaming royalty splits. Uh, so Wheeler had announced the decision to go 50-50 with artists on streaming two years ago at another Music Tank event, uh, in spite of the contractual obligations being much lower. Uh, last night, he said that uh, at the time, we thought, uh, you know, they thought it was important to make these royalties significant to Baggers artists, but they've always been clear that they would have to review this policy if streaming took off and uh, now that streaming makes up uh, 40 percent of beggars digital revenues uh, uh, the streaming revenues have to uh, bear the cost of a r marketing distribution and all those covers that need to be uh, uh, you know made up by the sales income of course uh, he also explained that uh, if uh, uh, they kept this rate at 50 percent and say that the company's uh, uh, you know uh, margin was 20 uh, percent uh, if they were paying 30 percent extra on what they usually paid for streaming and streaming becomes the main source of revenue then of course uh, the company would end up being out of pocket and wouldn't be able to provide the same services to their artists so definitely a very interesting statement something that uh, uh, resonated through the industry because baggers had been sort of uh, sh uh, sh been uh, Exemplified as a shining beacon of uh, of uh, 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 you know the the new world when it came to splits uh, because of their 50/50 policy, but the fact that they are revising it kind of makes us question whether that's a sustainable split, uh, given that Baggers has always been seen as a very artist-friendly label, and uh, if they could do a 50/50 split, uh, there's a good chance that they would would try and do it essentially. Uh, Nick, on your front, uh, do, do you think that? Uh, 50-50 uh, is, uh, is, is, is a feasible uh, possibility for independent labels going forward, or is it too high? W what are we going to see uh, next uh, when it comes to uh, splitting uh, streaming revenues? Look, I think they were paying 50% of gross, which seems huge. I yeah, 50%. Exactly. Of, um, but, uh, look, I'm not surprised they made that choice. Right, I mean, beggars, beggars are artist-friendly, um, and they make their decisions. Uh, there I go. Um, they they are as friendly. Yeah. Sorry. Um, but they um but they also um you know, they run a very, very tight ship and they're not gonna make decisions against the interests of the company either. Um you know, they're not a charity, they're not an artist charity. So um I'm not surprised that they've done that. Uh I, there are indie labels, um good ones out there that are that are um Offering you know fifty fifty very traditional kind of joint venture fifty fifty deals on you know across what they do. Yeah. Um. I guess that they're not the ones that are investing maybe quite as much, or you know, their setup means that they're sort of outsourcing a lot of the. Well, otherwise, um, a label like Vegas might be investing in. Yeah. Know. Um. So, yeah, I guess they're such a full service company, um, and they they do so much. Um, in house, that you know, they they do all their own digital, they do all that, that the PR and stuff. Yeah. You know, they're very complete multinational company. And their expenses are probably quite high. Yeah. Um, uh, I did, yeah, because I did find it interesting that Simon said that he doesn't think anyone would ever would be able to sustain a fifty fifty model. 
Yeah. Um, it very much yeah, as so, you said. It very much depends on how much they are investing in in the uh, artists and, and what kind of sections they have in house and what kind of sections they outsource out, out of the company. Uh, uh, Jasper, do you think that that's a thing that's going to come up as well at Music Matters in terms of uh, uh, you know there's a lot of discussions now if uh, uh, around whether. You know, if uh, streaming services are paying 70% of the revenues on average, uh, Spotify certainly is uh, uh, towards, uh, you know, the music industry. The key question now is the splits between the label and the artist because the artists are not seeing a huge amount of the revenue back. So do you think that's going to be a big point of contention as well to uh, talk about what split is fair at this point uh, when it comes to money going back to the artist? Yeah, look, I, I, firstly, I'm, I'm, I'm not qualified to answer the, the, the question of what split should go where. Sure, um, of course. I'll make that very, very clear. Secondly, um, you've just reminded me to... Um, Simon Wheeler does come to Music Matters every year, and uh, I need to call him. You've just reminded me. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, look, we, 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 there's, a lot of, there's a lot of digital throughout the whole week. We've got Digital Matters where, you know, finally the rest of the world has caught up with the music industry. Yeah. Uh, so we'll be talking about streaming video, streaming, uh, streaming movies, streaming content, uh, and then of course through music, there's there's a number of different sessions that that cover uh, various parts of of stream. So yeah, the, the question will undoubtedly come up uh, as to as to splits and and what have you. So uh, yeah, ho hopefully there'll be some good debate over that, and I'll be able to report back after the event sure. as to my thoughts. Let us on know. <laughs> exactly that's that's awesome well uh, i think i'm just gonna uh draw the show to a close uh, we are uh doing pretty we have had a fantastic show guys thanks so much for sticking around i'm just gonna run through a couple of uh, uh, quick news pieces uh, uh before we go that we didn't get a chance to cover so uh, first up uh, uh, aim the association of independent music uh, here in the uk have launched a uh, 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 a project called the AIM uh, Startup Loans, a new government-supported initiative designed to help entrepreneurs off to a good start with a new business, of course, in the in the music uh, industry. Uh, the scheme introduces successful applicants to experienced entrepreneurs who will act as mentors, and loans go from £1,000 to £25, and the average loan, uh, loan amount across the board is going to be about £5,700. Uh, and this is going to be definitely an interesting uh, development for uh, uh, new businesses that want to launch uh, here in the uh, UK uh, that are working on in, in a music vertical and uh, uh, also I want to talk about Prince. Uh, Prince has decided to bring his publishing in-house uh, and created uh, NPG Music Publishing uh, which has already worked on uh, uh, doing the sync for his track Falling in Love Tonight on the show New Girl and the company is currently looking for other sync opportunities uh, and uh, of course uh, they manage his entire catalog that he uh, he owns so quite a quite a uh, lengthy number of tracks there that are accessible now through MPG Music Publishing. Uh, the agency group uh, that represents the Black Keys, Gotai, Macklemore and Ryan Lewis has signed a, a deal uh, uh, agreeing to refer select clients to Pledge Music. Uh, so that's a, a big win for Pledge. And uh, I wanted to finish with a great post you should all check out by Elliot Van Buskirk on Evolver.fm covering Bacardi's campaign. Uh, and it, it involves uh, Austin's uh, uh, famous bat colony. If you don't know about this, under the bridge of Congress, uh, uh, on, on Congress in Austin, uh, there's a huge uh, bat colony that comes out every night uh, in a big fly that is a, is, a, is a big tourist attraction actually in Austin and uh, Bacardi have decided to film that event and assign to each bat that comes into the camera field uh, a, a trigger on Ableton uh, as they move around the screen and so that uh, essentially created a soundtrack uh, made by the bats. So a great idea for a company that has a bat for a symbol and uh, definitely go and check out that video. It's on YouTube but I've also linked to the story on Evolver.fm so you can check that out there. And guys, it was an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank, thank you very much for having us. Nice to talk to you both. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. As well. Good to see you, Nick. And uh, thanks Good so much. Too. And thanks so much for listening to the DMT show. You can find out everything on digitalmusictrends.com. The show comes out weekly, and also you should check out the DMT One to One show, which is also a weekly show where I interview uh, interesting companies, uh, startups, uh, and projects uh, working in the digital music verticals. So th thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week, and uh, till next time.